Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are recording today from various locations around Winnipeg, all within Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. Our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing Evie Drake Starts Over by Linda Holmes. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, though I'm currently found at the Henderson Library, and I started late, so it's hard to imagine starting over. Across the screen from me is... Hi, I'm Trevor, and I'm the branch head at the completely fictional but entirely believable Kel Cassett Public Library in the completely fictional but entirely believable Kel Cassett, Maine. And across the screen from me is... <laughs> Hi, this is Kirsten, and I'm the librarian at the Harvey Smith Library. Super excited that we will be opening soon to see your lovely faces again. A good book can carry me away from an ever ancient ordinary day. And you, dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. If you suddenly left us, we don't know how we could begin again. Let's keep in touch. You can find our email address and all our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. If you hang around till the end of the episode, you can enjoy our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. In a minute, Trevor is going to summarize this month's book, but first, Kirsten will give us a bio of the author. Okay, Linda Holmes, American author culture critic, and, of course, podcaster. Before we started, Trevor was saying, oh, you probably memorized uh, Linda Holmes' bio because I listened to her a lot on her podcast, the NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour. But I did learn a few things. So this is her bio. She grew up outside of Philadelphia. She grew up watching lots of TV, but also reading a lot of books. She tells a story that her school librarian in grade five gave her Rebecca to read. And then she moved on to Gone with the Wind, and then Stephen King, and then Jackie Collins by the time she was in high school. Just sort of an interesting path of reading choices. She attended law school and practiced law in Minnesota for 10 years until 2007. And while working as a lawyer, she began writing about TV and movies for sites like Vulture.com and MSNBC. One of her jobs was recapping television shows, which I do sometimes go and and read some of those sites if I've completely misunderstood a show. So uh, valuable, valuable uh, job. In 2007, she moved to New York to pursue a career in writing and criticism. One headline I read said, Linda Holmes leaves law to concentrate on watching TV. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And by uh, 2008, so one year later, she had been hired by NPR to cover pop culture. She hosts the Pop Culture Happy Hour along with Stephen Thompson, who is her best friend in real life. And in her book, she wrote she's indebted to him for his adventures in single parenting and learning from him for her book. She hosts as well with Glenn Weldon and Aisha Harris. We've, I think, alluded to Pop Culture Happy Hour a number of times over the years, and I would almost say that Time to Read was a little bit inspired by Pop Culture Happy Hour and their format and how they they set up. (laughs) Just a little bit. Just a little. Uh, She became a first-time novelist at the age of 48, and she says that there is a time for who you are to change at literally any phase of your life which I love to hear, actually, as a 53-year-old. Linda Holmes has described her go-to comfort read during trying times as anything that offers optimism, which she says love stories does for her. She says, I have certain things that I don't like to see in those stories, though. I don't like to see them become too rescue-oriented. I don't like them to become too rooted in people not liking each other and then suddenly deciding that they do. She is open about her struggles with mental health, There's an interview on the Hilarious World of Depression podcast, which is very, very good. And she is a baseball fan, a game that she calls a series of little dots of action surrounded by this wonderful atmosphere of relaxation and just blue sky 
ideally, I think the sky is important to baseball. And that's Linda Holmes. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. You know, baseball, depression, reading. Uh, boy, Love. She's, she, yeah, you know, I, she, it's like I'm looking in a mirror. She's speaking your love language. <laughs> <laughs> she is. So if you're wondering if you haven't read Evie Drake Starts Over, this is a little summary of it that I cribbed from the Goodreads website. In a sleepy seaside town in Maine, recently widowed Eveleth, or Evie, Drake, rarely leaves her large, painfully empty house nearly a year after her husband's death in a car crash. Everyone in town, even her best friend Andy, thinks grief keeps her locked inside, and Evie doesn't correct them. Meanwhile, in New York City, Dean Tenney, former Major League pitcher and Andy's childhood best friend, is wrestling with what miserable athletes living out their worst nightmares call the yips. He can't throw straight anymore, and even worse, he can't figure out why. As the media storm heats up, an invitation from Andy to stay in Maine seems like the perfect chance to hit the reset button on Dean's future. When he moves into an apartment in the back of Evie's house, the two make a deal. Dean won't ask about Evie's late husband, and Evie won't ask about Dean's baseball career. Rules, though, have a funny way of being broken, and what starts off as an unexpected friendship soon turns into something more. To move forward, Evie and Dean will have to reckon with their pasts, the friendships they've damaged, the secrets they've kept. But in life, as in baseball, there's always a chance, up until the last out. So let's start with her general impressions. How did you guys feel about the book? That that good, eh? <laughs> you left you speechless. <laughs> I know. I'm just leaving. I, <laughs> I was oh going to say, God. I was going to say, very readable. There were times when I was uh, like, oh, I'm not into this romance, but then I was still interested in the character of Evie, and maybe I wasn't all that. I didn't care that much about the romance between Evie and Dean. But I was drawn into their banter. I found it ver that very believable. I was um, entertained by their conversations. And I was intrigued by her character, uh, which I thought was quite well developed. And we certainly learned so much of her as the story went on, and especially about her relationship with her dead husband. So, I mean, I wasn't as keen about the romance part of it, but I, I, I read it and I was entertained by it. And I... Yeah, I mean, I liked it. Well, to quote the Princess Bride, I don't normally read a kissing book. So this was uh, yeah, unusual. And also I had a bit of apprehension before I read it, just because, just like you, Kirsten, I have been a huge fan of Pop Culture Happy Hour. And uh, when you listen to a podcast on a weekly basis and you have those people's voices in your ears, you, you've, you've got this false feeling of familiarity and yeah. it, in some ways you feel like you you know Linda Holmes more as a as a personality and as a person and that writing in some ways was like a sideline and so when this book came out it's almost like like a, a friend or an acquaintance has written a book and and you want to like it and you're yeah. like oh what if I don't like it and uh, but I'm happy to say I, I thoroughly enjoyed it uh, when it came out a couple summers ago in fact it was one of my hammock reads uh, that I always <laughs> like to say you know is just like how Linda Holmes will sometimes say certain movies are enhanced if you go to one of the theaters that have the reclining seats and so I think maybe Maybe the hammock also it couldn't have hurt with me reading this this beautiful fun story and uh, and then I just reread it again this last month to prepare for the podcast and it, I have to say it was just like putting on an old like comfortable sweater it was just nice Aww. to get back into these and because I know how the story goes I was able to enjoy it more and I I mean I was happy that there was a happy or at least an optimistic ending but you know you're when you read this you want things to work out and and you don't want to be disappointed but sometimes books and on a down note and uh but it was interesting because i don't really know a whole lot about romance novels so i had to look up the definition and apparently there's two qualities that have to exist if it, something's a romance novel the story has to primarily be about a relationship and it has to have an optimistic or happy ending 
Uh, anything hmm. else is just sort of, you know, variations on a theme or subgenres and stuff. So, so I'm happy to say that this book is about a relationship, it has an optimistic ending. And, and like you said, Kirsten, I found the dialogue very believable. Sometimes yeah. if dialogue falls flat, it really can take you out of a book, but just the banter back and yeah. forth. And I have to say, though, even though she's adamantly said that Andy is not based mm-hmm. on Stephen Thompson, I know. I, I hear Stephen Thompson's voice every time Andy opens his mouth. And I can't yeah. help it. And I just think, even though she, you know, subconsciously she must have based some of the stuff on their their relationship or their banter, you just can't. And, and oh, it's, for sure. It's, it's, yeah, it's just like, yeah, no, that's that's Stephen Thompson. You can pretend yeah. it's not, but that it's totally yeah. him. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. How about you, yeah. Dennis? I, this is the third romance I've read in my life. Ooh. I have not been impressed with the ones I read before. So, you know, I went in with a little bit of trepidation because it's not my genre, generally speaking. Um, one of the stereotypes about romances, which Kirsten mentioned in the bio, was often they are involve people who don't like each other at the start. And often the guy is a cad. You know, it's like he's he's a jerk. Why would you want to be with this guy? And the woman is cold and not open to anything and... You know, that that's a stereotype, which is not true of many romances, I'm sure. But I was really happy that these people were all nice. There weren't really any people that I didn't like. I mean, the, the reporter who was uh, ragging on Evie was, uh, was a jerk. And there were a couple of other jerks here and there. But they weren't a major part of the story. It was all about people who generally you would like. The dialogue, like you said, the conversations they had were great. I don't have any attachment to Linda Holmes or the Pop Culture Happy Hour because I've tried listening to that podcast, and I have to say, I'm, it annoys me. Uh, <laughs> Well, well, Dennis, I have to say that in our podcast, you are the Glenn Weldon of the group. (laughs) Oh, okay. I don't know what that means, but okay. But uh, I was really pleased with this book. Uh, It was it was a comforting, easy read, and I was thinking about why that was too. I listened to other NPR shows. And there's a kind of a stereotype about NPR that it's, you know, white, liberal, uh, reasonably well-to-do people, and it's stuff that's comfortable for them, which, you know, I'm, I, I fit those categories. And the characters were all kind of that same zone, mm-hmm. right? It's, it was, she even made a point at the beginning of saying, yeah, it's Maine. It's, it's a very white state. There aren't going to be a lot of diverse characters here. <laughs> yeah. And the characters all had the right political views and social views. They were, you know, made a point of pointing out the things that they thought. And so it was a very comfortable kind of thing for me because it just, it fits me and my demographic. And the author is almost the same age as me. And, you know, it's like, I found it very comfortable and easy to read well-written. And I also liked the topics like uh, Evie's dealing with the relationship she had with her husband. And we should really talk about that, I think, because as you're reading it, you discover that her husband was emotionally abusive to her throughout their relationship and that she couldn't even frame it that way for the longest time because that type of abuse is very insidious. And um, that's part of the problem. It's it's very easy to dismiss on the part of the abuser or uh, other people who support them. And the way they explored that, I thought was very realistic and useful. You know, it, it was it was nicely done. Yeah, I thought it was very well done because it just slowly emerges as almost Evie is slowly realizing or sharing some of her story to Dean and uh, but then slowly realizing herself to what extent it was actually abuse. Um, mm-hmm. And I think you're right that so many of us. And I think society don't always um, recognize those types of relationships as being abusive. So I thought it was really well done by Linda Holmes. Yeah. And I don't know if I was reading more into it than, than there was, but the second time I read through it, it felt like, yeah, each time that she reflected on her relationship with her husband, you got a little bit more of a memory of what it was like, almost as if she had repressed those memories. And, And as I was getting towards the end of the book, I was thinking, God, if this book maybe go, went on for maybe three or four more chapters, I wonder if we will have found a memory where he actually was physically abusive. Like at this point, like she says, no, it was always, it was never physical. Uh, it was emotional. But then it's almost like she's admitting to herself things. And I just, you know, uh, it was interesting to me how, how you, by, by the end of it, you really got a different picture of things and what she did suffer uh, mm-hmm. in silence for 
her whole life for, since high school anyway, really when she met him and was sort of taken with his popularity and his uh, status and stuff. But yeah, it was, it was well done. I, I, I don't know. I got, I got the feeling that it really was just emotional abuse. And, and that's part of why it was so insidious. Like, if it had been he had sexually abused her or physically abused her, it would have been easy for her to to talk about it because, you know, you say, oh, you know, what what's wrong with your relationship? Well, he hits me. Mm. That's something people understand. But you could tell that she was reluctant to talk about it because it's like, oh, well, what's wrong? Well, sometimes he's mean to me or like one time he said he'd bring home pizza and then he didn't bring it home and he told me that I was mistaken and he'd worked really hard and why was I badgering him? And trying to convince someone who, like say you know her husband's parents that that was an abusive thing to dismiss what she believed and kind of undermine her sense of reality they'd be like oh well i'm sure you just misheard you know that's that's what's so insidious about emotional abuse is that it's easy for other people to dismiss it because it's like well he didn't hit you yeah mm -hmm. you well know, yeah it's and, the ultimate and, gaslighting you know <laughs> like, yeah um, well yeah. and also it, it's almost like the uh, the stigma that you have with mental illness where well it's yeah. it's just in your head and you you know you, it's not a broken arm there's no cast that i can sign so you're just fine. smile yeah, yeah just think yeah of you happy know things. and so it's a yeah. very similar mm -hmm. idea you know that's that's, that's yeah. a good point yeah and so that's why I thought it was interesting, too, to learn a little bit more about Linda Holmes. And I don't think I really knew about her experience with anxiety and depression herself, personally. And I think that does come through that sort of understanding of just how some of mm -hmm. this all some of this all works. And I think it's interesting that Linda Holmes did say that she doesn't like love stories that are sort of rescue oriented, because certainly that's not the case. Like Dean isn't trying to rescue her, but Evie tries to sort of rescue Dean like that becomes yes. she she just shifts her focus from herself to Dean which is interesting because I sort of feel like often like the male characters are the fixers like I want to fix everything and she becomes that which is interesting and it really drives him bananas he doesn't he doesn't <laughs> want that and it made yeah it annoyed me too it was like just back mm -hmm. off evie what are yeah. you doing yeah yeah you could you could see the the way it would sabotage the relationship mm -hmm. if she kept pushing like that and dean's whole journey was interesting too like being someone who was extremely competent and like seen by the world as like this great pitcher and all of a sudden he can't pitch anymore the sense of identity that goes with that and how you shift from being something that you really realistically can only be for a short time in your life and then having to transition to something else was really well done and really kept me interested in his character as it developed too. Yeah. I felt like th that Evie's character was so well developed. So I was super engaged with, with her sort of. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's the baseball thing, but I mean, I wasn't as, I, you know, um, I understand that that would have been a really this yips, you know, it, it seems like a, just a wild thing to have happened to you all of a sudden. But I just, just felt like his character wasn't quite as developed. I, I mean, I know he was very good looking and mm -hmm. had a really excellent body. And, you know, I, because Evie was certainly talking about that a lot, which I enjoyed, actually. And we didn't really hear that from his point of view, you know, because we did hear from his point of view sometimes. But we never did hear about him sort of talking about how, you know, about her body or anything like that. I kind of like that. too. Well, it was interesting <laughs> how, yeah, like Evie's character like like it seems like linda either made a conscious choice to not describe her physical characteristics yeah. um the same way that say dean what you know had the green eyes and the little fleck you know dark hair or whatever it was yeah. and, you know uh, and i wonder if that was intentional whether she kind of wanted people reading this book if they if they saw evie's character as sort of a, an avatar for themselves they could see themselves in that character mm -hmm. i don't know if mm -hmm. she defines well i guess She's in her 30s. They're both in their 30s, I guess, right? The characters? Yeah, I something guess. Something like that. Yeah, because at first I didn't even realize how old she was. Like, I think when I went into this book, I didn't realize she was a young woman. <laughs> I didn't, hadn't read the description very, very closely, obviously. But then <laughs> An octogenarian <laughs> loses her husband. <laughs> <I> and, <know. laughs> and then takes up with a... <laughs> with a baseball that, that's player. A book. Wow, that's a whole different story. <laughs> But then, yeah, as you realize that, oh, they were together since high school and it's been 15 years or whatever. Yeah, it's about, you know, 
in their in their 30s. So still very young. Yeah, yeah. The other really important relationship in the book was her friendship with her friend Andy. Mm-hmm. And uh, that dynamic really changed a lot through the book, too. Like, there, there were transitions all the way through this book. Mm-hmm. What did you guys think of Andy and Evie as friends? Again, I really liked sort of the description of their weekly breakfasts and, you know, again, their conversations. And it was just easy and flowing nicely. And then even just the descriptions of then how close Evie was with his girls. And obviously, she supported him during his divorce. And again, it made me think, oh, yeah, Stephen Thompson and his two kids. (laughs) And uh, Mm -hmm. I think Linda Holmes is very close to that family as well and to his new partner now as well. I totally agree with Andy in terms of I would have also been very disappointed that she couldn't share really how she really was feeling around her husband's death. I mean, I think I would have felt a bit, I don't know, about offended or, um, you know, that all this time we've spent together and you're not actually being real with me. Um, but they were able to sort of come back and and rebuild this relationship in a new way and probably a, a much closer um, relationship as well, even though they couldn't do their weekly pancake meetings anymore. But yeah, yeah, yeah it, what, was, it was interesting. To- what I liked about that whole dynamic, too, was that when Andy did get girlfriend, who then became his fiance, that... Although it's ambiguous, I mean, there was, you're thinking, okay, Evie was upset, there was a little bit of jealousy, but what I liked about it is that, I can't remember her her name, the, the new girlfriend, was it? Monica. Monica. That she became an ally and yeah. became sort of like the bridge between Andy and Evie, and if it wasn't for her, perhaps, her sort of ob- objectivity or just being that m- much removed, she could see maybe the uniqueness of their friendship and that it was something special that Andy's kids life would be um, lesser for it if Evie wasn't in their life. And, and she played quite an important role towards the end of the book in terms of helping them patch up their friendship. And I thought that was sort of an unexpected, un- unconventional mm-hmm. um, part of their friendship, just as the platonic friendship that they had was also unconventional. And of course, yeah. Lots of people could not understand it in the small town where they're like, well, why aren't they dating if, you know, they obviously like each other and they're eating breakfast. uh, And so it was I liked how Linda Holmes kind of took certain maybe conventions or expectations and and turned them on their side a bit, but not completely uprooting the the genre, but at the same time making it interesting to read. Like, okay, these people aren't just one dimensional characters. Even these secondary or tertiary characters have something interesting to provide for the story. Yeah, I was, was I was worried that when they had their big blow up, Andy and, and Evie, and she sort of accused him of being secretly in love with her. And he said, you're mm-hmm. crazy, which was, you know, both were very, very upset. And I was so worried that then the story was going to turn around and Andy and Evie were going to get together. And no. um, that that was going to be sort of this, you know, the turning point of their relationship that then they would. And I'm so glad that that didn't happen. Spoiler, spoiler, it doesn't, doesn't happen. <laughs> but I'm so glad because, no, they're meant to be best friends or very, very good friends. And you're right. You don't really see that a lot. You see, you know, women and gay men as best friends, you know, or, but you, you mm-hmm. don't see, um, and it's not just small towns that then make assumptions if you're friends with a man, uh, a woman f- friends with a man platonically. I think it's everywhere. It's society. They just don't understand that. Well, there must, there must be sexual tension. Hmm? No, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. <laughs> Since we mentioned podcasts a lot, I listened to a podcast called Oh No, Ross and Carrie, and Ross and Carrie are friends who both have separate relationships, but their friendship is really, really strong and intense, and you can hear it in the show. And uh, I've had friends, friendships with women, too, that don't affect my marriage in any way. I like to see that modeled, too, in popular fiction. And like you say, it's not shown enough, but they're out there. There's plenty of people who have these friendships, and it's Absolutely. good to see and good to see it without it changing into something yeah. for the sake of the story. Yeah. 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 And, and Monica was really awesome, too. Like, 
oftentimes you would expect a person in a new relationship to maybe be jealous of a friendship like that and to go out of your way to make sure that that friendship stays strong and to try to become a friend without being, you know, a clingy jerk about it was really, really nice to see. That's mm -hmm. part of what I liked about the book is so many good people being nice to each other. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. on the whole, you know, that people are good people. Um, and, and, yeah. and that can still make a good story. Yes. Um, I think like, you know, it doesn't have to be, oh, the, you know, the stereotypical jealous girlfriend and jealous friend and that, that can only make a good story. It can make a good story to have the support of <laughs> good people as well, I think. Although, you know what? I was reading this book and I feel like now a year into this pandemic, I feel like it's also affecting how I'm reading some of these stories because when Dean and Evie were starting to get closer together and he was like, you know, his lips on her back of her neck and I thought, oh my God, getting so close. That is like <laughs> a lot of droplets. Like, oh my God, aerosols, aerosols floating in the air. I And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's so, I need to like, es I need to read these books to escape the pandemic. And so, but I did realize like with the romantic part of it, I was like feeling like, oh my gosh, so much closeness. And I, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't like that about myself. I, you know, I, I, uh, it's, that's a, unnerving thing that um you know the pandemic is already sort of invading uh, my 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 dreams as well but i don't want it to be invading my escape literature <laughs> so <laughs> well and this that's actually a statement on art in general like novels music other things like that it's not just that you're experiencing the book or the song or the movie you're translating it through the filter of your own life all of the time. Mm -hmm. And with the pandemic, uh, we're all experiencing similar effects on our lives. And it does change the lens through which we read these things, because I had a similar reaction to some of that stuff. And I have that when I watch TV shows that were filmed before all of this started. And you're looking at it, thinking about elements of the story that normally wouldn't have even been on your mind, right? right? It's like, oh, they can all gather together and watch a baseball game and they can have a barbecue and things like that. And it does change how we see everything else around us, too. Yeah, and I th I think that's that's really true because I did uh, – and, and even, uh, Trevor, what you said about Linda Holmes not really describing exactly how Evie looks or even like her age that much so that a female reader uh, uh, like myself can place myself in that Evie character. And so maybe that's why – because, I mean, I was also relating to like when she was – when she knew that there was going to be a sex date and like preparing herself, which annoys me too, the <laughs> whole preparing of your body. And it was annoying her too, I think. But also like, you know, taking out her mascara and being like, oh my God, this is two years old because I haven't used mascara since Tim died. And okay, before my next sex date, I'm totally going to buy some new mascara. Like, I just thought that kind of stuff was funny. So it's sort of in there because I was like, oh, I can relate to some of that stuff. And so then his lips on the back of her neck. It's like, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute, but we're in a pandemic because I'm here too. So yeah, I think that's a, that's interesting phenomenon right now. Um, how we, we experience, um, we should, we should maybe have, have put a trigger warning on the book that there's water droplets, uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and there's neck kissing at one point. Neck kissing. I don't know. It's something about the neck kissing that is really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, too, that I did like that, yes, this was a, a romance love story between, you know, this man and this woman, but uh, it was also a love story, friendship story, too. The the love mm -hmm. and the challenges of Evie and, and, and Andy, but also like a like a growing new friendship with Evie and Monica, but also then the, 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 the sort of the family story, too, you know, with her and her dad, and then this sort of kind of disappointment of her mother too. But like the love story kind of had its tentacles in all of the relationships, um, which mm -hmm. I kind of, which I did qu quite, quite like. Yeah. Yeah. It felt very true to form. Like the relationships all felt pretty realistic. Like mm -hmm. there, I know plenty of people who have that kind of a relative, like her mom, who you feel like you're supposed to stay close to, but it's like, there are real problems there. Uh, one of the questions we asked on social media was about how Evie took a break from speaking to her mother because the relation, like her mother 
didn't respect your boundaries very well at all and uh, was very dismissive about a lot of things that were important and that hurt Evie. So we had asked too, like, have you ever had to break from a relationship in order to keep it healthier? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, what really what struck me actually was how many women left during this <laughs> in this novel, right? It was her mother left, Andy's wife left, Evie was going to leave, like there was a lot of people leaving. I mean, for me personally, I definitely have taken a break from talking to perhaps a specific person in my life. But unfortunately, it sort of then has resulted in like a forever break, it feels like, you know, and uh, w when you do sort of finally kind of realize like, no, actually, what's good for for me and my well-being is to not have interactions because I'm worried too much about making them happy. And I need to actually make sure that I'm taking care of myself. And that's, again, what Evie finally figured out for herself too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I, I can relate. I guess it's a super personal question to ask on so social media, you know, <laughs> because it's like often if you do need to take a break from someone, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's kind of an intense, um, situation that perhaps happened in your personal life. So, um, yes, that has happened to me. Um, but, uh, and, and so I can, I can relate for sure. Yeah. And, and like in, in my, if I'm thinking back in my own life, there's definitely been friendships or relationships that I've, I've had to step away from for my own, my own health, my own happiness, keep my distance, but never with the hope that things will get better and we'll, we'll resume our friendship. It's more like, okay, I just, I've recognized that this is not working. This friendship is not healthy. This isn't good. And then, and then it's sad when you have to sort of call it quits, whether you're the person calling it quits or whether you're the person being quitted on. But yeah, I've never really had an experience like that where you take a break and then everything sorts out in your friends again. I think, you know, it's just the natural course of life. You, you change and develop. And I mean, I have certain friends that I've had for a very long time that if I were to meet them today on the street, probably would not be friends with them but we mm. have a history and mm. that's what that's the glue it's not yeah. the um other ones the glue wasn't strong enough and we drifted so yeah yeah i mean i guess in in evie's case i mean this is her mother that you're talking about right. and, and 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 so it would be harder to imagine having to make a break with a parent, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, I find that harder to imagine. And I think Evie does as well. So maybe that's why maybe just thinking I just need a break for now. And hopefully we will sort of come to some sort of but but you might not come to, to some sort of resolution or a place where they can reestablish a, a, a different relationship. I, I will say just like I've had a couple of situations like that where I've cut off a relationship for a period of time. And I do have one where the relationship got better afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it can work. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, won't go into details. Yeah. <laughs> but but I'll also say on record, like uh, a lot of people feel like you can't break away from your parents because they're your parents. Yeah. And there's a lot of societal pressure around that. But I will say that there are many situations where the healthiest thing you can do is to never speak to a parent again. Mm -hmm. There are some parents that do not need to be connected to, mm -hmm. you know, their kids. Uh, obviously, that's a difficult decision to make. But like in Evie's situation, I think it made sense. And she's being cautious about it. And other people in more difficult situations, it's okay to not see your parent Makes if this relationship is bad for you. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, and I mean, Evie kept saying, like, I am named after my mom's unhappiness. Like, yeah. she obviously yeah. was carrying that, you know. Um, so even for her just to take some time to kind of work through <laughs> some of that and not take that on, well, maybe was was necessary. Yeah. Do we have any final thoughts about the book before we move on to our next section? Well, I alluded to it in my introduction that, as you guys know, I often like to go to uh, Google Street View uh, <laughs> to see real life locations in books. And I was surprised, dismayed, frustrated, and 
kind of impressed that uh, Linda Holmes completely uh, created Calcasset, Maine. It's uh, no such place. I, I can't tell you how many times I went up and down the coast, the rugged coast of Maine, looking for it, <laughs> looking for the, the bridge over to the island. does not exist except in the author's imagination. And so I think that was a huge um, accomplishment, it just by creating a, a living, breathing town that felt a little bit like Stars Hollow from uh, Gilmore Girls, a little bit like uh, a weird town that maybe Stephen King might write about but uh, very believable. So hats off to you, Linda Holmes. Maybe we'll see some more stories uh, from Kel Cassett. Who knows? I did enjoy like all the little sort of extra details. <laughs> like I think right away from the beginning, she talks about taking two public broadcasting uh, fundraising mugs down to pour coffee and like totally, you know, because <laughs> the NPR is always having fundraising, annual fundraising times. So I love those type of types of details or even just all the descriptions of Evie as a reader. You know, she reads ev anything like articles in magazines, books, uh, books on history, books, uh, mystery books. But she also and all the podcasts that she listens to and she gets Dean turned on to true crime tr podcasts. And so I, I quite like that. Um, and even just some of the, the talks that she has about texting and how she has a special meaning for the heart, the different colored heart emojis that only she knows, but right. you know, yeah. <laughs> that's important yeah. to her. I don't know, just some of those little details were very, I don't know, appealing. And I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, it added to the story for me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Like, I, I like certain kinds of prose writing better than others. And this one was just very easy to read. Like you say, the details that were in there felt very true to life. It was easy to get involved into. This is the first time in a while that I've read a book in three days, um, yeah. which, you know, uh, normally it takes me longer to read it. Our previous book <laughs> took uh, <laughs> weeks for me to read, even though it was shorter. It was so short. And, and actually... <laughs> I made the comment last time that, you know, the V, uh, which was a good book, but it was, it was super information dense and it was hard to absorb it all because every word was full of meaning. Mm -hmm. This book was spaced out in a way that it felt very easy to absorb, very comfortable. It was a super easy read, but it had enough stuff in it that you can dive in and think about all these different things. So it's a book that you can take on different levels. Mm -hmm. uh, as shallowly or as deeply as you want. And you yeah. can get something out of it. So I really like that. Yeah. And it, it was often talked about as, you know, a beach read or a great summer read. And, and I think that does a disservice <laughs> to it, actually, because, um, yes, it was very readable. So, yes, that's what you kind of want when you're lying in your hammock. But there was more to it, I think, than just a frivolous kind of beach read. I was, I just wanted to say one more thing. I loved the scene about the wedding china, like the wedding, um, oh, yeah. plates oh, that yeah. she had, you know, cause you know, you have a registry and then you buy these, you get all these place settings of this china that you don't even really like married, you know, from a marriage to a man you didn't love anymore. And then the whole scene of her smashing the plates, because again, I could relate to her. Maybe some listeners who participated in the smashy smash with me will, <laughs> will understand as well where I have gone to a garage and just smashed plates when you're feeling super frustrated. And I thought, oh, that's way too aggressive for me. That's way too like breaking things. But oh my gosh. What a relief. What an amazing thing to do. So I really, really related to, to that, um, to that whole scene. I did like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was pivotal too in her, in her Absolutely. journey to stake her own claim and to start over, I think. And, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Moment. Yeah. So I guess we can all say we approve and recommend this book. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. And now we're going to move on to our most awkwardly worded segment. Can you tell me a book I would also like? I'll go. It's actually not a book. Uh, it's a short story that I just found, and it's online to read, actually. It's a short story called Timeline by Lily King, who is a writer that I really love. Uh, she wrote Euphoria and uh, has just written Writers and Lovers. That's her latest book, 
which I also really enjoyed. And this is available online for free from OprahMag.com. Lily King, uh, it's been sort of this timeline uh, short story has been described as a woman's messy love life. And I think that I, I do enjoy that type of romance. Um, she often, in writers and, and lovers as well, she sort of describes this very sort of creative main character and sort of the, yeah, the messy love life that she gets all um, mixed up in and, and timeline is similar. Um, I really love her, her writing. And similarly to Evie, Every Drake starts over the conversations and, um, banter that she has, not really banter that's, uh, too frivolous, I guess, but, uh, conversations that she has with the other characters are, are really, really well done and draw you right in. But it's a lot of sort of really wild kind of romantic dramas. And there's this, this one, this one, uh, paragraph that I wanted to read aloud. Uh, this is sort of from the middle of the short story. And, um, she writes, on the way back to Vermont, I thought about words and how if you put a few of them in the right order, a three-minute story about a girl and her dog can get people to forget all the ways you've disappointed them. <laughs> and that actually brought me back to the book as well, Evie Drake, because of course at the end she gets a dog, which actually kind of, that sort of annoyed me a little bit too. I don't know. I mean, I know Linda Holmes loves her dog. Um, she got a dog, but you're I was you're like, a "Oh, a what?" <laughs> <laughs> but it's also funny because in one of the last podcasts that they did on NPR Happy Hour, they um, were talking about Nomadland and the movie Nomadland with Frances McDormand, and their uh, Aisha Harris was on the panel and talk. Well, she's part of the regular panels, and uh, she was talking about how she doesn't like it when in stories, a woman gets a dog and then you know sort of learns how to love again or. <laughs> And then later when I was reading this book, I was like, oh, no, Linda, <laughs> you did exactly what Aisha doesn't like. Anyway, this was a very, very lovely, well, interesting short story. Also a romance, bit of a quirky, messy uh, love story called Timeline by Lily King. And it's I will put the link up to it um, because it is available for free right now on the intranets. Nice. Well, if you're like me and you enjoyed the detail of a fictional town in Maine, as Linda Holm portrayed it, you may enjoy my book that I've suggested, which is called Vacation Land, True Stories from Painful Beaches by John Hodgman. Now, um, <laughs> the state of Maine has held a special place in my heart for many years because of Stephen King. There's a whole mythology about the towns that he writes about, fictional or otherwise, Derry, Castle Rock, Jerusalem's lot. Uh, and uh, what John Hodgman does here is uh, writes a series of short stories or short essays talking about his life and growing up. And a good number of the stories take place in Maine. And incidentally, the motto for the state of Maine is Vacation Land, which is why mm. uh, where the title comes from. And uh, the stories are poignant. They're often very funny. For those of you who don't know, John Hodgman is also a podcaster. He has a very funny podcast called Judge John Hodgman, where it's like the people's court, where people will write in with uh, you know frivolous disputes, and, and he adjudicates them. Uh, he's also, a, uh, interestingly, friends with Linda Holmes, and they have uh, interviewed each other over the years. And he's appeared on Pop Culture Happy Hour, and she's appeared from time to time on Judge John Hodgman. So there's certain uh, a shared love of the state of Maine. So if you're if you're looking for something that's you know a variety of stories, but that captures that kind of quirkiness that Maine provides, I recommend Vacation Land by John Hodgman. Nice. So my book recommendation may seem a bit out of left field this month, but I'll try to explain. I'm going to recommend Big Trouble by Dave Barry. Now, Big Trouble is not a romance. Dave Barry is better known for making booger jokes in newspaper columns <laughs> than for his novels. And Winnipeg Public Library doesn't have any copies of it anymore, so maybe I should have picked something else. <laughs> but it's the book I've read that's closest in certain ways to Evie Drake, and that's why I'm recommending it. I liked Evie Drake Starts Over largely because it was a comfortable read with characters I liked. It was pleasant, fun, and was very readable. Big Trouble is like that, too, but also features kids up to some mischief, embezzlement, hitmen, a mysterious and helpful homeless man, and a wacky chain of events. 
So it's not exactly the same as Evie Drake, by any means, but it hits the same kind of spot in my brain when I read it. If you've ever read Carl Hyacin, it's kind of like that, but lighter and gentler with less bite. They also made a movie version starring Tim Allen in 2002, which is totally worth a watch if you can find it. So, Big Trouble by Dave Barry. Mm. Hi, my name is Toby, and I'm an outreach librarian based out of Millennium Library. I'd like to recommend the sci-fi novella To Be Taught If Fortunate by Becky Chambers. I don't normally read sci-fi, but this was recommended to me, and it has a really nice cover, and um, it's very short, so it's pretty approachable. It's not one of those big, thick, scary sci-fi novels. Um, So To Be Taught If Fortunate is the story of four space explorers who are tasked with visiting four faraway planets. And all these planets are known to have life on them, and the explorers are to study that life. And every planet they go to is, is fascinating. One is covered in ice, one is almost all water, and uh, the life they find on each of these planets is so, so interesting. And the mechanics of how they travel and how they adapt to each planet and how they live and study on each planet because they're on each planet for a considerable amount of time, all of these things are just really, really well considered. And because they're exploring these very far away planets, they are away from Earth for decades. And Earth is drastically changing while they're gone, and they stop getting updates from Earth, and they become unsure if there is anything to actually come home to. So just lots of really, really great stuff going on in this relatively short piece. The four explorers are diverse and well-developed. It's so beautifully written and thoughtful. And it's something I've continued to think about long after I finished it. Highly recommended. So now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, in which we write little love notes to the words and phrases that have captured our hearts. (laughs) I'll go sort of a a caveat, you know, as always, uh, this nerd word is the result of a bit of a journey down the rabbit hole. This month really has been about um, starting over. And especially for my son who moved away this month to Berlin. (laughs) So very much starting over. And then uh, I was sort of I've been worried and uh, wondering how that was going to affect me and perhaps starting over uh, without having a child. Okay, he's 24. A child at home anymore. <laughs> so, so just that that's been in my mind. So, um, I was looking at the New York Times uh, word of the day that they have. And on February 10th, which is when Isaac moved away, the word was resplendent, which is from the 15th century, meaning to shine, to be splendid, which seemed like a, a perfect word for what, what was happening in Isaac's world right now. And I thought splendid. That's like, that's a great word. I don't use it enough in my vocabulary. So then, of course, then I looked at splendid from the 1620s. Marked by grandeur is how it's uh, defined. And it's probably a shortening of the earlier splendidius from the early 15th century from the Latin splendidus, meaning bright, shining, glittering, sumptuous, gorgeous. Uh, but then it also went on to define it as in splendid isolation, which is a, a, a f- word phrase from the late 1800s. So, of course, I glommed on to splendid isolation because what I have actually found is that, yes, I perhaps have a little bit of an emptiness from Isaac going off to start over his life. But really, what I have found instead is that it's a bit of splendid isolation (laughs) to have my space back. And this phrase is actually attributed to Sigmund Freud, who coined it back in the late 1800s to describe both the frame of mind and but also the conditions under which he was writing at that time. So it refers to the state of being alone and one in that the person who was is also, though, unbothered by being alone. And especially in this time of isolation, this was a type of isolation that I'm not minding, splendid isolation. Now, I I need to also say that it's been used much more regularly as a term to describe the 19th century British diplomatic practice of avoiding permanent alliances, (laughs) 
So it's much more of a this military or this diplomatic term that was actually coined uh, in 1896 by a Canadian politician. But all that aside, I'm taking the splendid isolation, combining splendid and being unbothered by being alone once again in my space. I don't mind it at all, while at the same time being thrilled for my son who is starting over himself. Hmm. So splendid isolation. Well, I'm going to pick up on your resplendent part of your <laughs> nerd word, and I want to talk about a Canadian performer called The Weeknd. Uh, <laughs> recently, he performed at the Super Bowl uh, halftime show in a resplendent show, mm -hmm. and honestly, like you know, I'm the last person to pick up on pop culture, so I had heard the name The Weeknd. I didn't know anything about it or him. It was a person? It was it a band? Turns out it's a man. And I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed his 11 or 12 minute show. I, it's available on YouTube if you haven't seen it. And I wanted to learn a little bit more about him. So apparently his real name is Abel Tesfay. And he decided that maybe it doesn't sound like a rock star name, does it? No. So he started calling himself the weekend as far back as high school when he dropped out and every day became the weekend for him. <laughs> and uh, that sort of was his nickname. But then he had to, you, anyone who's, uh, you know, a word nerd will know that he spells his name without the last E. So it's W-E-E-K-N-D, which drove me crazy for the longest time because it's not correct. Uh, but the reason, <laughs> the reason he did that, though, is apparently, like, of course, in typical Canadian fashion, there was already a Canadian band called The Weeknd. Mm -hmm. And to avoid copyright infringement, he just dropped that E. So he's the weekend, and mm -hmm. there the weekend is still around, which brings me to what actually is the weekend, generally speaking. <laughs> so you might be interested to know that it's obviously a time of every week that's not considered the week day. And so different cultures define it different ways. For example, some cultures, well, our culture, Saturday and Sunday. And that started, of course, because Sunday was seen as the day of rest and the Sabbath. But then the Saturday, Saturday was the uh, Jewish Sabbath. So that is from sunset on Friday to the fall of full darkness on Saturday. But then some Muslim-majority countries historically uh, would have a Thursday-Friday weekend because that uh, suited their religious cycle as well. But today, in the last 10 years or so, a lot of the uh, Muslim countries have changed their weekend to Saturday-Sunday in the interest of business and commerce and that kind of thing. Capitalism. So, uh, um, capitalism ruins something else. <laughs> and uh, so, But the actual five-day work week is a relatively new thing. It's a 20th century sort of concoction that began in the early 20th century. You know, so it's a fairly new kind of um, idea. You may be interested to know that some countries ha only have a one-day weekend, either Sunday or Friday or Saturday, like Nepal. And mm. I just want to throw one more thing in. Brunei just does it completely differently. They um, have a non-contiguous working week where the good people of Brunei will work Monday to Thursday, then Friday is uh, part of the weekend. They work Saturday, and then they uh, have Sunday off. Oh. So, I mean, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but <laughs> anyway, so just to summarize, even if everybody is working for the weekend, as Loverboy would have us believe, not everyone is working the same days of the week. <laughs> Go. Nice. Uh, another uh, nice cultural Canadian reference. Yeah. So you obviously don't like go on to TikTok a lot. Hey, I, I don't even know what TikTok is. <laughs> I, I understand weekend, that like all of all of uh, his songs are on TikTok where everyone's doing all these special dances for his songs. And it's funny. That's you know, that's why I listen to pop culture happy hours, because if I'm not, I don't always watch the right TV or, you know, read all the books or listen to all the songs. But I get uh, I get introduced to a lot of them on uh, pop culture happy hour. <laughs> OK, so. For my word, I'm going based on, in this novel, Dean experienced something called the yips, yes. where he lost his ability to play baseball at a high level. So my nerd phrase this month is more or less the opposite, and that phrase is the zone. So being in the zone, also known as being in a flow state, is, according to Wikipedia, 
the mental state in which a person performing some activity is fully immersed in a feeling of energized, focused, full involvement, and enjoyment in the process of the activity. In essence, flow is characterized by the complete absorption in what one does and a resulting transformation in one's sense of time. When you're in the zone, it's like the world slows down and you can see everything you need to see in order to accomplish your goal. You're confident, focused, alert, totally into your task, and feeling good about it all. It's an optimal experience. It's often associated with sports. When a basketball player drops 40 points onto the opposition or the quarterback keeps throwing perfect passes play after play, the commentators often talk about them being in the zone. But it's not limited to sports. Any activity where one has a moderate to high level of skill that matches the level of challenge and has immediate feedback so you can tell how you're doing can lead to this state. You might be at work and just sailing through all your tasks efficiently and effectively, feeling super productive and handling everything with an even keel. You could be playing an instrument and just have the whole performance down pat, getting every nuance just the way you want it. The zone is a mental space of focus, confidence, and skill, and it feels great. The zone is also a challenging thing to achieve. Not everyone experiences it, even once. It requires a certain level of skill and practice, the right level of challenge, an ability to focus, access to necessary resources, and perhaps other factors. Don't fret too much, though. You can still perform at a high level, even without being in the zone. Ooh, I like it. I'm, that's that's going to be my goal now, to be in the zone within my splendid isolation while dancing to the weekend. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So unfortunately, that's all the time we have this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. For March, we're reading The Saturday Night Ghost Club by Craig Davidson. Goodreads describes it as a short, irresistible, and bittersweet coming-of-age story in the vein of Stranger Things and Stand By Me about a group of misfit kids who spend an unforgettable summer investigating local ghost stories and urban legends. With a pitch like that, how could we resist? <laughs> If you want to tell us what you think we should read next, connect with us on social media or through email. You can find all our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all our past episodes and discussion questions there, too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us, too. And until next time, make sure you find Time, time to Read. read.